Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. I am glad to be talking on this episode with a person that I've interacted with for the past few years, met in person once, and that is author and artist Jared Cullum. Jared, thank you for jumping on and talking with me for a few minutes today. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for having me on the show. I love the show. I've listened. I've been a listener for a while, so oh, I really thank like you. the uh, episode. Uh, Probert's episode was really great. I really enjoyed that one, but I love everything he does. Like Life Hall is, you know, so fantastic. And then oh, yeah. you had a really, I liked you really, you had a short one with Joey Weiser that I really liked. So mm -hmm, I love mm -hmm. Joey's stuff. I've, I've uh, kept up with him since I like started drawing. So I, I used to go to Heroes Convention uh, and I would see Joey and Drew Wang and some other guys, and I would see them every year and kind of see what they were doing. As I was starting to get into it, I was too embarrassed to share anything. So it was, uh, <laughs> it's been, <laughs> it's been nice to get, you know, to get to know him over the years. So I'm, I, I love Joey Weiser's stuff. He's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love both of those guys. And, and they were kind enough to come on. And uh, I only have people on whose work I enjoy and appreciate. So I'm well, uh, glad you're enjoying the episodes. It's an honor, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks for that. That means a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'll mention a couple of titles and then we can talk a little bit about uh, a few questions by way of origins and things like that. Uh, sure. The first book that I found of yours is Cody. And uh, I think you have a copy of that oh, yeah. somewhere handy. Copy my copy right is in my wife's classroom. Um, cool. It's a wonderful and, and beautiful book. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Thanks very much. It was my first, uh, you know, full length graphic novel by myself mm -hmm. so <laughs> uh, i'm currently working on the sequel to it so kind of drawing around the clock trying to get that uh, oh, wow. all drawn so it's almost all drawn now so essentially it'll just be like a and i'm tightening up the dialogue so essentially it'll just be a big coloring book very nice. soon so that <laughs> that should be fun and you use watercolor is yes that right mm -hmm. uh yeah everything i do is entirely watercolor so um i'll use some gouache on top or acrylic paint sometimes um and uh and I use all traditional media, not for any specific reason, other than that's just what I sort of connected with and what I really enjoy using. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I don't, I have kept up with tech just in case, uh, you know, so I didn't feel like I was totally, uh, had totally fallen off the train of time, so to speak. But um, my obsession and my sort of passion in life is kind of studying art history and painters, particularly from the late 1800s is my favorite era of painting, uh, early 1900s and studying their use of light as a tool of storytelling and then trying to use that glean what i can from studying those paintings and then like use that in my own storytelling um so uh everything i do is is watercolor yeah so if i have to make corrections and things then i will uh you know usually just cut out another piece of watercolor paper and tape it on top or glue it on top depending on it so oh wow wow yeah um I've been lucky enough to work with people who kind of understand the process enough that they're cool with that. They don't uh, like, I don't draw backgrounds. Typically I typically uh, try to think about the shapes sort of switch into a different mindset from the contour line idea of drawing or simplifying uh, by way of contour lines, shape language in cartooning and switch to shape language of uh, visual space. So that's something I spend a lot of time studying and, like on location, planar painting is kind of the overly fancy word for painting outdoors, just painting on location. I do mm -hmm, a lot of mm -hmm. that so I can build a repertoire and a backlog of a bunch of paintings uh, that sort of give me an idea of shape language. So the way light hits objects, what kind of colors happen. And then I typically sort of, you know, wing the background, I guess you'd say, by yeah. uh, thinking about the shape language. So it's like toggling back and forth between the shape language of cartoons we're thinking about things in terms of taking the intense expanse of reality and simplifying it into just our simple shapes and then mm. thinking of a similar way. I, I, I really like that sort of marriage between the two, between traditional painting and cartooning in that they're both have essentially the same goal. So mm. love that. Yeah. yeah. Take the intensity mm. and simplify it into something that's sort of simple and poetic. Yeah. Yeah. So when, when I guess in terms of the composition, then, so for the the contour part for the the lines that you're drawing in, that exists sort of probably in the foreground most of the time. Yeah. Um, and then the the shapes sort of make up the rest of the the page in the world. I hadn't, hadn't yeah. thought about that. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, I 
honestly, I just, uh, I directly drew on my own history and, and things that really inspired me growing up that I was very excited about growing up, which is mostly, uh, mostly animation actually. So, uh, <laughs> particularly the, uh, 50s to 70s era Disney, yeah. particularly the, the, uh, Xerox era of Disney. Uh, so like a hundred one Dalmatians and, um, Robin hood and, um, jungle book. And those movies where, uh, you have a kind of outlined contoured character sitting on a beautifully painted background that was heavily influenced by golden age illustrators mm-hmm. uh, and uh and also that era of art history that i i particularly love so um that is that's what inspires me visually what i really kind of connect with so i um i basically try to just cheat the same kind of concept which is to mm. have a painted background and a contour line based character in the foreground um you know on top basically sitting on top in in the same way in animation cell which i know some people in comics don't like to sort of blur the lines between the two so yeah, yeah. i just sort of i don't know it's just that's what excites me that's what interests me and i, I don't know i don't know how to connect with uh <laughs> with the greater world of comics because i i think some people probably uh don't think of what i do as drawing cartoons i mean i've had people explicitly tell me that at shows like sbx but i I don't know how to do it any other way. It's what I like. And it's, it's how I like uh, to think of things and do things sort of like when I draw on my own inspiration. So. Um, yeah. Well, I, I don't think that comics have to be, you know, one particular thing. I don't think there's like the, the pure comics form and as far as uh, media, as far as presentation. So I appreciate what you do. And that that's honestly probably, oh, yeah, I don't want to sound like I'm fishing for <laughs> no, no. I'm just, uh, <laughs> I'm just reflecting on like shows where I've had you know things people have said to me about the the type of pictures I draw. So yeah, uh, yeah. But some but people that... I know don't like the idea of blurring the uh, notion, I guess you'd say, of a camera or whatever in mm-hmm. comics. They like to think of it more as a pure form of. I guess you'd say symbols or icon icon. I don't know. I'm not intelligent enough to actually articulate this i'm not a very articulate person you're so. doing great you're doing great <laughs> I, I'm, I apologize to your listeners i've probably put them asleep already i'm not i'm not very uh i'm not good at talking um no no, but, uh, no. it's interesting to to hear about uh probably what stands out on the page to me and and the way you bring that together because i i don't usually analyze it to that degree when i'm reading it so um, i think it's an overlooked in my opinion i think it's an overlooked uh, tool of simplification because mm-hmm. like I was saying about the stuff with plein air painting is like when I'm plein air painting it's essentially the same thing as drawing cartoons it's just a different shape language it's a different mentality but mm-hmm. it's the same idea right that, like we're taking all the crazy value and complexity and instead of simplifying it into circles and squares and triangles I'm doing a similar thing but I'm thinking about the value the lightness and darkness of the three-dimensional space and then you know, the color theory aspects of it, but it's essentially the same concept. It's just instead of uh, using lines and simple shapes to create icons, I am doing the same thing just with the value. So the light and dark. Mm-hmm. So where the shadow falls across things, how these things connect to one another, it's a very similar idea. It's just a different kind of shape language. So I like to think of that like a tool, you know, in your toolbox, it's just a visual tool that you can use to communicate with people, try to connect with people. And um, that's why I like it so much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think you're the first person that I've talked with on the show that's talked about plein air painting and and working in that way. And um, I know there's a a huge amount of observation that comes (laughs) in artwork and representing what you see around you and sort of having that keen eye. So that's interesting to think about um, creating comics, but then also stepping out and doing this thing that, that people would probably consider like fine art and then mingling the two together and saying, yeah, actually comics can be represented and uh, can reach the the levels of fine art, which I think they, they can. And I think they do. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think that's something I connect with on both levels to between the two aspects of what I do. And I'm sorry if this is another rabbit hole, uh, but uh, I, you're, I, good, I, I, you're good. I like uh, I like that uh, because I my main focus is watercolor. And that's what sort of drives me. It's what I go to sleep thinking about, wake up thinking about and um, am constantly sort of practicing and working at. And I like 
both in cartoons and the greater fine art world and then with watercolor and the greater fine art world there's this sort of idea i think of hierarchy that i've run into and experienced and seen and heard people talk about who are better than me or further along than me where they're not considered necessarily the higher level of art i like that with both aspects of those things because i think in traditional painting there is this sort of uh idea that oil painting is the high art that oil painting is the kind of greater you know thing and that if you're doing watercolor stuff you're doing it to do studies so that you can do your oil paintings <laughs> which are the things that have matter and meaning so i like the idea that both comics and watercolor are both sort of relegated in a sense to this uh i, I like that but i think they both have such a um they're both such an intense tool for yeah. communicating with people and creating kind of um, interesting poetry that connects with people directly. I think it's uh, it's a very powerful tool. Um, I like to think of those things like like the light and painting and things like you know. Um, you, know did you, did you ever read the Stephen King book on writing or whatever? Mm, I think it's love called that on one, yeah. writing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or whatever. It's very good. Um, I like that he talks about writing stories as um, you know solving a problem. Like you're a plumber essentially with a toolbox and you open up the thing and you have your your uh you know grammar and that kind of thing is that these are all tools to solve the problem i'd like to think of those different aspects as the same with making pictures essentially because mm -hmm. i'm always trying to tell a story which i guess is essentially trying to connect with people to take an idea that's sort of a novel size and condense it to a the size of a like a poem or a haiku or something and uh and connect with people i think that's the sort of issue the problem that you're trying to solve is to mm -hmm. find this sort of meeting place where we've have shared experience like a collective conscious kind of idea where we've all had the same kind of pain we've all had the same kind of happiness highs and lows and suffering and we can connect with one another and i think that's sort of the the core goal of storytelling and so all these little aspects are like they're like tools to try to solve that problem of the gap between human people you know that we can connect with one another yeah yeah well i also love how he normalizes the process in that book mm -hmm. because you were taking you were talking about taking parts of watercolored paper and sort of like pasting them on if you needed to correct sure. something and when you open up that book to the end he's got those pages where he has editing marks and uh i, I think there are still lots of people that think oh uh, if i'm going to be a writer if i'm going to be a creator or an artist i just have to do it perfectly the first time right. And there's no yeah. margin for error. And if I make a mistake, I, I just must not be good at it. And I love yeah. that he uh, pushes back on that in that book, too. Yeah, I love it, too. And that that mentality has been a lot of the driving force of my own producing stuff. And yeah. I run into that a lot teaching students, either, both in the cartooning world and in the traditional painting world, where people are taking a class or doing something to build up to their big, uh, you know, their big project, their big life project or whatever but you just have to kind of push the snowball for a little bit each day mm -hmm. and it's the same with writing and traditional painting and that kind of thing you know yeah yeah now i'm gonna also mention that you have this book you have wonder city which is a collaboration and uh this was the book that i got from you when i met you at heroes con this year and yeah. so just to give people a glimpse of of what the pages look like there um, really, really beautiful work that you do. And uh, looking back at it now that we're talking about it, I'm thinking now about the way you compose with those figures and cell animation and the watercolor background, which just creates such a striking uh, mixture. If I'm using, if I, if I can use the word mixture. I think it's, uh, well, that's the goal is to try to create atmosphere and depth, I think, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and give a an atmosphere for the characters to exist in to sort of hopefully allow you to kind of place yourself in it. Same with doing just traditional paintings, too. Um, and yeah, that one we I did some digital editing on because of the time constraints, because I was working oh, with yeah. people and I didn't have the time to just sit in my studio and cut and paste mm -hmm, mm -hmm. do stuff. So on that one, on some pages, we I where we would need to redo stuff. I would have to or fix the scaling on something. I would, I would just do that in Photoshop, which is why I'm glad I kept up with Photoshop knowledge, yeah. but um, yeah, but it was, it was still uh, really fun to work on. And um, so that one is like 99% maybe traditional media. So mm -hmm. um, watercolor. Um, 
but yeah, that's the, the goal is to create that kind of, um, you know, atmosphere to, so that people can put themselves in the world and try to experience it a little bit more than Mm -hmm. something that might be flat. Um, so, and, and also just thinking about it in terms of light. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I w I was going to ask about that difference between the collaboration on a book like wonder city versus getting to, to work in the projects where you're sort of the person and it's sort of sure. doing all the things that, uh, well, it, you know, it's always at a certain point, it's a lot of it is collaboration and maybe you get to a place or people who are further along or stronger than I am get to a place where you have total say, but you know, even on my own stuff, I have an editor, so it's not mm-hmm. that far removed. Uh, granted this was a little more specific. It was nice to have some constraints. I think that kind of also helps develop ideas because there was already a lot of the heavy lifting was done in terms of uh, thinking through. So Victor, the guy that wrote the book, he had already written the whole thing and written the script. And um, they had initially had the concept as a uh, animation pitch. And so I had got to know the other guy in the team who worked on the book was Zach. And I had got to know Zach and he's a very close family friend. And um, they were working on this idea for an animated pitch and they had seen the stuff I was doing and wanted to know if I would do some of the kind of concept art for and character design, like look of character work. So I had done that a while uh, before we started working on the actual book. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then they decided to make it a book and it was picked up. So, um, so we just sort of, you know, parlayed that relationship into a longer term relationship working on the graphic novel. Um, so it always depends job for job um, on the team you're working with. So sometimes you have, um, you know, I've done stuff with uh, like I did, did stuff with Jim Henson for a while and, you know, I had a, editors, they were all very nice. This is not a complaint. I'm just saying there were editors at boom. And then there were editors at, uh, or at Arkea, but, uh, and then there were editors at Jim Henson. And so when mm-hmm. I would do like a character in the background, it would have to fit the sort of look. So they would have to pass it up the ladder, so to speak. Uh, and, and different people would have different inputs. I never had any like nightmare stories. The only nightmare mm-hmm. story I had working with Jim Henson was of <laughs> my own situation, which is that I had, uh, a bunch of pages drawn for Fraggle Rock that I was having to get turned in. Mm-hmm. And, um, my son who was three at the time decided to help me. So when I was cooking dinner or something, I went back up to my studio and it was like maybe four pages of drawn, totally drawn pages that were taped up and ready to paint. Uh, He had colored with crayons, Ah. which is very (laughs) permanent on watercolor. Mm -hmm. There's no getting that out. So I just had to, and it was, they were due like in two days. So I had to like, I just sort of scoop everything up and go to a coffee shop and just like, draw redraw everything as fast as possible but actually working with them was wonderful i never had any complaints and same with working with victor on wonder city um that i think i think you can get into a situation i could see how you could easily get into a situation where it could quickly turn into a nightmare because you're working so closely with someone especially with someone who has a very passionate vision so like Mm -hmm. victor had a very passionate vision um i think luckily for us Victor, me and Zach have a lot of the same sort of influences growing up and the same kind of visual um, things that we get really excited about. Mm -hmm. So it was nice because we were all kind of excited about the same sort of visual ideas and there wasn't anything where it became like, and and it was, I I also was able, I felt like I was able to like text and say, Hey, I I don't, I don't know if this works. Maybe we should change this. And, and they would listen and we would work with it or, or they would say, well, actually, and make a case for it and whatever, and we'd work, move through it. So I never ran into any situations where it was like, we butt heads or anything. So, nice, um, nice. but I could see how, because you're working so close with someone that could become difficult, especially on a graphic novel, because I mean, they were with me for a hundred and, you know, 60 something pages. <laughs> so mm-hmm, it wasn't mm-hmm. like a 10 page short or a four page short where we were just sort of like, you know, it was, it was a lot of pages and, and uh, that we went through together. So um uh but we uh, the the they were great victor and zach were great they're they're like i said they're both close family friends so um you know luckily it was a situation where we were grew closer through the project and mm-hmm. and uh would love to work with them in the future on stuff but um but i could see how if you were working with someone that that, that you 
had differences on, especially on something that long term. It could be, it could be quite difficult. Um, and then working on my own books now, I'm working on two books, and uh, I'm working with with uh, Top Shelf, and uh, they are very um, uh, supportive of mm-hmm. sort of mm-hmm. your artistic vision. So they, uh, I've I've never had an issue with them, and they're very open to whatever I think visually can go on. They put a whole lot of trust in just what I want to do. Um, and so, uh, they were very, in terms of like over my shoulder, they were very hands off on doing on like Cody. So, um, Mm -hmm. I did a lot of stuff that I wanted to do, which was Cody was sort of, I had been doing like in, uh, this is such a meandering answer and I'm sorry if I'm putting people to sleep. You're fine. (laughs) I was actually going to ask about next, uh, project. So this is perfect. I was, uh, I, I, uh, um, got started drawing what well, I don't, it was like 2011, maybe 2010 or so. Everybody was doing web comics at the time. Everyone mm-hmm. had RSS feeds. Everyone was doing web comics and everyone was doing journal comics. It was like a popular thing at the time. So I got into comics doing that. And, um, I had, I had always wanted to draw. I'd always loved drawing, but I, I quit drawing because I've never had any sort of natural talent with it. So I quit because I didn't see any sort of prospect for it, any like a future prospect for it. Um, and then uh, I had made a very close friend who was like a mentor to me. And she, uh, her name was Kelly. And she was like, you know, you talk a lot about wanting to draw, but you don't actually do any drawing. You should, you should just, just try drawing and see, you know, and mm. she gave me a copy uh, of a graphic novel and uh it totally blew my mind because i didn't grow up reading a ton of comics i was very fascinated with animation and and act outs and like uh recreating animated scenes when i was a kid Mm -hmm. but i um i don't know what combination of being sheltered or whatever a lot of it just went past me i didn't uh see a whole lot of comics growing up so i didn't know exactly what that kind of what was under that hood and Mm -hmm. she gave me the graphic novel uh, blankets and oh, yeah, uh, it yeah. totally changed my life because I had no idea you could just do a book about you know life or anything and, and really honestly that book is probably why so many people were doing uh journal comics and <laughs> in that time it's still the remnants of that like sort of uh popularity but um so I read that and I and I really got into ink. And so I was trying to, I thought, oh, maybe I could be a comics inker someday. Because uh, I never thought drawing would be in the cards for me because I, I could barely, I mean, I was drawing like stick figures. It was not good. And I was 26, so I felt like that ship had long sailed. Mm-hmm. And um, and so I got really into inking and I was trying to do all these, these uh, mm-hmm. practice with inking. And then uh, I started doing a, a web comic to give myself a deadline would also her idea um, to impose some kind of strict deadline so that I don't just trail off into whatever else kind of hobbies. And um, at a certain point I, I decided it wasn't quite the mark I wanted and I had gone to, and I actually went to CTN in LA or Burbank rather to um, it's an animation conference and uh, the mentality of people and a lot of it i'm sure comes from just the desperate need to try to get a job because everyone there it's like in in burbank going to that convention was like the kind of classic la stereotype of like all the waiters have scripts and oh right right whatever in burbank because of the proximity (laughs) of like dreamworks and disney like all the everybody has sketchbooks everybody's trying to make it but the mentality of like the people I encountered were so like, they got up early. They just did drills, like drawing, like everyone was just working so hard. Like I couldn't believe it. And, Mm -hmm. um, and then I went to this bookstore called Stuart and G that has like a lot of rare graphic novels and art books and animation art books and interesting, interesting stuff. Um, anyways, they had the books, uh, Portugal by Cyril Pedroza Uh and, uh uh, absolutely changed my life like can't even like so there's so many layers of everything that i have done since that came from that experience of going to that convention and seeing people who were just like doing figure drills in the morning and then planar painting to take a break and then doing more you know just like working so hard and then the book portugal at that time you can get it in english now you should if you're listening it's fantastic (laughs) he has other books now too since but um 
the the book Portugal at that time was only in French. It's this big. I still have it on the shelf. It's this big, beautiful hardcover French book, and um, I read it. And I don't speak French or know anything, but I was able to read it yeah. with no hesitation. Just mm-hmm. like, and it just blew my mind. And I think that's why a lot of my comics are relatively sparse in terms of dialogue and writing. Is because I I have. I've since been trying that first initial read where it was like, uh, you know, you can tell the relationships falling apart by the, the weather is rainy. The colors are moody, the Mm -hmm. faces, the, the dynamic of the expression and the posture, um, is so specific that you can read it without knowing what the language is. I don't even, the language didn't even help for me. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. it was, uh, it was so uh, life changing for me to see that. So I I decided to kind of take a break from the web comic, and um, I had seen uh, also around that uh, time the the comics mm-hmm. of Louis Trondheim, who will color in his comics with uh, watercolor, uh-huh, and uh-huh. he just sort of colors them in. Um, I mean, he he has some pages where he'll do like an establishing shot that's fully you know painted. He is very capable. He's very good, but for the most part, he's just sort of coloring in um with watercolor and it has this really nice kind of sensitive touch which matches his sort of thing also journal comics mm-hmm. um they're beautiful they're anthropomorphic kind of uh animal versions of him his family and then friends and other people um it's just day and day in the life basically or trips he's taken and things like that but they're so simple and elegant and beautiful and the watercolor goes right with it like it mm-hmm. the the kind of light sensitive touch of the softer colors um go visually really well with that language so i thought i'd like to try watercolor and then that just felt like for lack of a better phrase like a fish in water like it was Mm -hmm. just sort of it just felt it was so exciting and then i got into like okay well who else paints watercolor and that led me back to winslow homer and john singer Sargent and that era of painting and that kind of got me down that rabbit hole of studying those people and i just became obsessed and traveling around trying to go to museums and doing little copies and trying to study how to do uh watercolor and then how to do watercolor like the masters were doing watercolor like andrew wyeth and um painters from art history so i started going to the library and i basically took like a year off of drawing the web comic and i was like i need there's a gap between what i am in love with and where i am at with the web comic which was digitally colored and and I hand drew it, but it was digitally colored, just sort of inked with microns. Um, but I, I felt like I, I had did like 500 of those strips at the time. And um, I was started doing figure drawing and, and that sort of drew me into that. And I was like, well, I need to take some time. If I, if I want to get to the level like this pantheon of heroes I have, mm-hmm. I need to re, retool and refocus. So um, at that point, I sort of quit everything, any kind of thing that was taking my time that I might be doing for fun <laughs> on the <laughs> side, so to speak. I quit everything. And, uh, you know, I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm preachy. I know this is redundant and stupid to say out loud, but no, I quit no, watching television good. and uh, playing video games, anything like that. I just sold everything. And I started getting up and doing figure drills and then going to figure, which led to me teaching figure drawing and, um, and then going to the library and getting all the, large print books and just copying paintings and copying paintings. That took like a year and I just no slowing down, no break mm, for about, I mean, I don't want to exaggerate, but maybe about six, seven hours a day wow. on a minimum, wow. at least, mm. you know, if we went on a trip or whatever, I just took a, my stuff in the bathroom. And when people, would, my family would go to sleep, I'd just keep working and uh, work overnight if I had to. And it was, um, it was kind of a tough time too, work wise. Cause like my wife was in between, she went to nursing school. And so she worked when I was in school for graphic design. So I was working, but I wasn't making enough at the time. So I started working at a Starbucks too. So I was working from like, you know, I'd get up at like four, three or four and I would work at Starbucks until 9am or 10am. And then I would go into the graphic design job until five and go home and then just draw as much as I could until I literally most of the times fell asleep at the table and my wife would have to get me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and wow, uh, yeah. 
I just, just trying. And then I ever, I had a little like a slide out drawer at the job too. So every lunch break, like I'd watch right when it hit lunchtime, I'd pull the stuff out and draw as much as I could. Um, and just doing drills and anatomy drills and, um, and then figure drawing a lot, a lot of figure drawing. So I found every local figure drawing group and I would go to every single one, um, and just do drills, just do, you know, either focusing on anatomy or whatever, but trying to pinpoint specific areas. I was weak and develop and grow on those things. Uh, and then that led into plein air painting because I wanted to, and then that led to teaching plein air painting, which taught me a lot, actually Mm. teaching both anatomy and plein air painting taught me the most, I think about, uh, drawing and painting. Cause then I had to actually put it into words, Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. instead of just sort of this nebulous, uh, you know, hope for the right kind of color or saturation or that kind of thing you know, you'd have to answer if people said like, well, how did you get that green or whatever? You'd have to think through, yeah. well, it's uh, you know, it's trying to do lower stature, you know, that kind of thing. So um, after that time, I decided to take all these things. And I also was doing mini comics because at the time I would do SPX and uh, I hope I haven't put everybody to sleep, but um, you're good. I, I you're good. was uh, uh, going to SPX and it was sort of the thing it was like the goal was every year have a new mini comic, like a 22 page short story. And that was the other problem I had because I couldn't close that gap either. Mm-hmm. So I was doing all these short stories, which I really like doing, little 20 page or whatever, you know. And then you'd go to Kinko's and make a ton of little minis. And then I'd go and sell them for two bucks or whatever at, at SPX and trade with people, mostly just trading with people. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh and so I was doing all these short stories and I wanted to, I, you know, my the dream was to do a graphic novel, to do my own long term. Uh, form st- story and figure out how to create a story that was that long and uh, that managed pace and that I could carry longer than 20 pages. Cause everything I would think of was just like a, an event, like a thing that would happen, but it wasn't something that continued. So I had like three short story ideas. And um, in that time I was trying to work through and I had talked to my friend Kelly too, at the time too, uh, about these different ideas I had. It was like a fisherman who was kind of down and out, um, you know, trying to rebuild his life. And then I had a kid's book idea about a bear that gets lost in a city that doesn't belong. So he's like Mm -hmm. a kid's book. So totally fantasy. So he's bumbling through things. Like he gets a job as a waiter and drops everything and tries like he's, it was a, just strictly kind of a kid's book idea. And then I had uh, another one about this um, who was older, a high school age girl who was having trouble with friends and um, that kind of thing. And so it was talking to Kelly who I I got the idea to why not just, if I have these three different ideas, just try to put, see if you can put them together somehow. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. So that was what became Cody. And then I made a pitch for it and kind of tried to do uh, my sort of, the thesis of that time I spent studying and like, this is what I want it to look like, what I want, like the, my stuff to look like using traditional painting and watercolor and creating a story this way. And and this is what I want the characters to look like and that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, I pitched it and I got just like a hundred percent rejection and, um, everyone told me it was not good. <laughs> and, uh, and then eventually I, I met, um, uh, Chris Staros from Top Shelf, who I uh-huh, had been going uh-huh. to cons and giving him every year, I would give him one of my mini comics. He was very nice because <laughs> I I had met him when I like before I started really focusing on drawing. So, you know, um, not that like skill is the only thing that matters, but you know, he had known me from when I was when they were l- much less technically involved, mm-hmm. uh, skill wise, and so. Um, but he he uh, had seen one of my watercolor ones and told me if I ever did anything, if I ever wanted to do something with watercolor to talk to him. And so I ended up I went and I was like, hey, here's this thing I want to do. And and he wow. uh, he ended up taking it. So um, nice. it worked out great. Uh, and then he ended up doing doing uh, doing Cody. So awesome. that's how awesome. I ended up doing uh, uh, the watercolor comics. Love it. Along Love that it. way, though, it was I was picking up stuff, too. So like doing the traditional comics you know like the rejection of of cody initially when when everyone rejected it um that led to work because it was someone rejected it sent it to someone else who rejected it sent it to someone else who knew someone at jim henson and they ended up saying like we don't want this but we could use you for you know 
these different things. And I ended up getting involved with, with, uh, um, boom and Archaea, although they ended up, uh, a lot of the people I worked with are not there anymore, mm. but, um, so I don't know who's, who's running it now or running that, that part for Archaea. I'm sure there's people, but uh, yeah, the yeah, people that... I was with who I became close with are, are doing different stuff now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One, one path leads to another. Um, I wanted to give you the chance to share web spaces, places where people can connect, sure. um, events and things like that. So I have a YouTube channel that teaches traditional painting. Jared loves to draw and, um, you know, it has a Patreon for full length demos and then the shorter versions of paintings. And it's mostly on traditional painting. And then I have my, well, you know, website and then just all the social media stuff. So Instagram, uh, Twitter and Facebook. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I, I'm glad to share about your work. And I, I think we could do a part two if you want to do a part two. Sure. At some point. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I wouldn't put people to sleep. No, no, it's it's fascinating. It's it's interesting. And I love hearing about the path and um, the way that you approach the page. So we will plan on another talk soon. Sure. Um, Thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah. Great to feature you and uh, glad to talk again. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.